Armstrong Williams is a political commentator, entrepreneur, nationally syndicated columnist, and host of The Armstrong Williams Show. Locally here in Washington, D.C., you can watch the show on Saturdays on News Channel 8. Armstrong, thanks for having me on. Actually, it's my pleasure for a change. <laughs> uh, it, well, last weekend, yes, yes, it was It was great to be a part of your panel. And you can also listen to his podcast, The Strong Cast, on iTunes. Armstrong, thank you for doing the Daily Signal show today. We, um, we're uh, grateful to have you in our studio. Uh, I think it's fair to call you a media mogul of sorts. Uh, you, of course, are the uh, largest black owner of TV stations in America. Uh, all those uh, things that I just listed, you do. You're prolific on Twitter and social media. Uh, as you survey the media landscape today, what's your strategy for developing successful content and programming? Well, you have on the one side... You have the MSNBCs, the CNNs, um, and then on the other side, you have the Foxes, one to the extreme right, one to the far left. And to me, they are both are the same. Even when you speak about whether it's health care, uh, whether it's the tax cuts, uh, anything that the president does, or uh, anything that the left does, you know exactly what the right is going to say, and you know exactly what the left is going to say. I think more and more those two sides are really being drowned out because obviously they've invested their capital, their allegiance into not a belief system, but into a party. And I think when you invest so much into a party, you literally forget who you are. You could forget your value system. And it's no longer about you. You're no more than a slave. You're dictated to and you just follow the dictate of the party. I know because I was once that person. And so when you sort of shut out those opposites, which are the same, then somewhere you find those who search for the truth, who search for the balance, who doesn't necessarily want to write a story like most of the media does, who wants to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner of the president or of the left. You tell a story and you allow people to come to their own conclusion. Because what you've learned in the climate that we're in today, that Americans are very sophisticated. They know when they're being misled, they know when they're being mis manipulated, and they know when they're being used for pawns. And one of the reasons why we have someone like a Donald Trump in the White House today is because of the dissatisfaction of the left and the right on Capitol Hill, because they work from the same platform. It's just that when the left want to do something which they know that their base is going to be infuriated by it, they get the right to do it. And so therefore they get a pass and they go out and do, uh, and do these famous stomps and these speeches and this outrage to pretend, pretend that they don't like what is being said, but it supports the gen and it's vice versa. And so the American people for so long, you look at the landscape, people are still dissatisfied. Whether they have the Clintons in the White House, whether they're the Obamas in the White House, people are dissatisfied. And the reason why Trump does so well, because the American people have lost trust and faith in the people they elect. And if the conservatives think they're immune from this, and it's only this ratchet up uh, anxiety and angst against the left, then they're mistaken. So Trump has been able to capitalize and just shake it up, throw all the bombs out, and let us start from ground zero. And so what we try to do, while we may criticize legitimately the president on Charlottesville, on his s-holes comments, and when he says things that's beneath him, that is not worthy of the grace, the class, the dignity of the White House, you must criticize him on that. Um, because then you become a sycophant and you're no longer respected. And then the White House will use you to do their bidding as the right and the left will use somebody else to do their bidding when they realize that you're willing to sacrifice your own principles to push an agenda that's not necessarily in the best interest of the president. Because the president cannot have someone around him always saying that everything he does is right, correct, and moral because it's not. But still, the American people knew when the president was running for president when he took out all 17 that he took out the standard bearer of the Democratic Party, that he was a flawed man. He's no different today. But you would hope that you have people that would help him find the character, the temperament um, that is necessary to lead this country because the American people really want this guy to succeed. But the problem is he is his own worst enemy. And it's very difficult for us to say that. But his legislation, and I know I'm all over the place answering this question, but that's why we call it a podcast. But still, with the tax cuts, with what he's done, with the market that was just 
regulation was out of control, what the president has done, sending a message about illegals in this country, and that we need to respect the rule of law, and we need to protect the American interests from, uh, from threats that will harm us who find their way into this country and bring about destruction. So I think what, where I find myself is what I've learned to do. It's irrelevant what I think. It's irrelevant what my politics are. It's irrelevant what party I belong to. What is relevant is that I take all sides without my trying to tell people and trying to guide them to a conclusion I want them to come to. And I just laid out there and let people reach their own conclusions. And that's what you call journalistic integrity. Yeah. Thank you. Those are some great points. I was familiarizing myself with some of your more recent work this week. And something that I thought was really important, you mentioned the victory is in the struggle that that's an aphorism that you frequently use. Can you explain to us what that means and how you see it in your day-to-day life? Well, you know, there was a time in my life early on when I found myself in um, storms of life. You know, I've always believed you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or going into a storm of life. And I had, uh, which many people know about, because when I write columns today, and I like to read all the comments. One of the things, the, the criticism, if they're not talking about my sexual harassment lawsuits, then they're talking about my no child left behind. And they say, oh, this guy, he's lost all credibility. He's just a shill for the government. And while um, I, I did promote no child left behind, and it was disclosed, what people have to understand, no matter how much you may have paid your dues um, and you've able to rise again, you never live down the fact that you compromise your integrity and your character. And that may have happened in 2004, but even in 2018, I still have to live with that today. It's just like the Bible and God. You know, God forgives us for our sin. He forgives us of our adultery, our lying and cheating, but there's still a price we must pay. Uh, and it can be forever. And so what I learned from No Child Left Behind, even though I found myself in the valley for eight years, even though it was a struggle, we lost 95% of our business. We never laid off one employee. They never missed a paycheck. I, I learned something about my character. I learned about what my mother and father taught me, that you should always be moral, ethical, and legal in whatever you do. Because sometimes when the sun is so bright, you cannot necessarily see your flaws because everything looks great around you. But in the darkness, you know, in the stillness of the night, um, when you think about your life and the struggles and you think that you no longer have no friends and then someone tells you that you only be a footnote in life, you really test your faith. But in this struggle, there's a piece that came over me. If I just could hang in there, go back to the value system, which I grew up on, learn my integrity, not be a shill for some party, be honorable. And even though none of us are going to ever be perfect, that when we rise out of those storms, we will find the character and the leadership and the criticism that is necessary for us to move forward. Because the problem is we lie to ourselves more than we lie to anybody else. And it's so easy for me to look at Rob and criticize him and look at you and criticize you because that's easier than looking at myself. So what I've learned in all my struggles is that when I work on myself 24 hours a day, which is the hardest work in the world, the world around me automatically improves. So what I find myself, instead of trying to dig into somebody else's problem and their issues, while I do that as a journalist and a broadcast owner, the most important work I have to do is work on myself. And since those days, I've never looked back. Well, Armstrong, we're, we're, we're celebrating Black History Month, and you've had a busy week. You've been to the White House. You were at the National Museum of American History, African American History and Culture with the Vice President. Um, You've been on Twitter and follow him on Twitter at a right side, uh, sharing examples of black achievement. Can you tell us what it means to you? You know, it, it's it's what it means to um, all of us. You know, we all sometimes we define success. Somebody could get a pair of tickets to a Wizards basketball game and they have courtside seats. Somebody could get an autograph of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas or a Michael Jordan or we can land tickets at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, or you get an invitation to sit in the president's box while he's speaking at the State of the Union, or you could be worth a billion dollars, or you could meet the lottery. Success is defined in so many ways, but there's something I think that we all can agree about is that from human slavery to de jure segregation to civil rights, when we look back and realize how 
our brethren at some that was retreated in this point in this country literally goes against everything that we as Christians and decent God-fearing people have ever believed that they were packaged um, and manufactured and raped and disregarded and dehumanized and it's just not who we are as Americans and never will be who we are as Americans and as a result of I think the greatest sin against our countries we still have these vestiges of segregation and bigotry and poverty and people are so willingly uh, to use the excuse the reason why they have not progressed because of slavery and I don't think there's any American that is alive today that can ever use slavery as an excuse as to why they have not been able to progress. I think we live in a society today where we will always have the poor and the struggling among us. But anybody who's willing to work hard, have discipline. Uh, and, and, and my um, friend, Dr. Carson, says this often, and I agree with him. Being married, not having babies before you're married, and getting a high school and college diploma um, 92% of those people never end up in poverty. And it all goes back to morality. It really does. But, you know, we've sort of abandoned morality. We like to call racism, racism, and all these things. But what we're dealing with uh, with a world that is broken, there's a spiritual illness that's in this country. And so, you know, yes, while I, I, uh, I know many people see me as an American who happens to be black, my race and your race has nothing to do with your achievement. Now, some people will say, well, people look at you and you get an opportunity. Yes, there are a lot of people who get looked at but don't get the opportunity. Your race is not a passport to success or failure. It's your character. It's the choices that you make and how hard you work. And then time and chance happens to us all. So my achievement, yes, you know, I've been blessed. Uh, it actually surprises me, I guess, more than it does anybody else, because I don't take it for granted that when I wake up every morning that I expect these things to continue. I still have to work hard, and I have to still live in a certain way, a certain way um, when people are not looking at me. There's a certain way. There's certain choices that I must make, because I, I've realized the choices I've made before, and I find the better moral choices I make, uh, the more I respect myself, the more I reinforce values and virtues, the better I become. And, we're, and you know, we employ hundreds of people across the country with our television stations and our media platform, and we create opportunities. You know, 55% of our workforce just happen to be Americans who are black. They're not our employees and our executives because they're black. They just happen to be the best qualified. It's just that we seek to find the best and the brightest, you know, like Sher Michael. Uh, who you see on TV and others, who runs our communications department, we want to empower them because when we see them, because at some point we're going to step off the stage, that is the future. And so, yes, I know um, it's important that for blacks to feel that they see other blacks, it gives them encouragement that they can achieve and they can be better, and that's a good thing. But Black History Month, Black History, Black Achievement is a tribute to America not to a race, not to a culture. It's a tribute to the ideas and the freedom as to why people come here sacrificing their lives, leaving their families, because they realize this is a place of opportunity. And if people can come here as strangers who cannot speak the language at all, and in two or three years they're speaking the language and they're thriving, there's no excuse why most Americans cannot find, or at least at some point, at some seasons, realize the American dream. You mentioned Dr. Ben Carson, and this week you posted a photo with him at the White House. Can you give us some insight into your relationship with him and the role he's playing at the Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development? Well, you know, Dr. Carson is a, is a brother to me. I've known Dr. Carson for 25 years. Um, for, the, for the last 20 some years, I was his business manager, managing his money and his financial portfolios. And you know, when someone trusts you with their money, and their finances, that is a truly a bond of trust. And all three of his, his sons have worked for me as producers. They've at least stayed with me in my home at least for a year. And they've all have been a part of our um, growing media organization. Um, and as Dr. Carson's business manager, you know, uh, you know, you get to know someone pretty well. And, and I say this often, you know, I've known many people in my life 
I've worked with people who have contributed greatly and mightily to this nation. But Dr. Carson, I always say this to people who ask me about him. If Jesus, if he were among us today, Dr. Carson, without any doubt, would be one of his disciples. There's just no question about that. It shocks me just how good, how moral, how ethical, and what a good man he is. Why does it shock me? Because it makes me better. It's because of my association with Dr. Carson that I become a better human being. He knows all my flaws, all my shortcomings, and he accepts me no matter what he may preach. Dr. Carson is just a very, a very good person. You know, in, when he was uh, seeking the presidency as a presidential candidate, uh, I was involved. I was probably called the invisible hand. <laughs> But it was always present. <laughs> I will admit that. Okay. And there's just no way. I mean, we trust each other. I mean, there's a trust, there's a bond, there's loyalty. And you know what's amazing is a testimony to the brotherhood is that we never had conflict. Because you know what? Um, I've always been transparent with him. Always the truth. Never try to manipulate him because I know that's who he is. And it's sad that we live in a society today where people feel they cannot be themselves. They have to lie. They have to per perpetrate something perpetrate something that they're not. But with Dr. Carson, you have the freedom to be who you are. He's very forgiving. And at HUD, you know, he's doing some remarkable things there. I was talking to him. Uh, in fact, we were joking at the White House this week um, during uh, President Trump celebrating uh Amer Black American Achievement Month that, you know, Mulvaney and those are trying to cut his budget um, down to 18%. I believe that they cut his budget. Dr. Carson would literally resign. There's no question I believe that. But I was talking to him and he said they kept his budget levels at 14%. I said, well, thank goodness, because I'm glad we're not losing you, because I need you in the president's ear, talking about morality, talking about goodness, because he and the president have a very good relationship. And I think that whether people see it or not, Dr. Carson has a very calming effect on the president. I think it's impa very impactful. And I think of all the things that would be said when the Trump is no longer in the White House, I think the story will be told about the impact Dr. Carson's relationship had on the president's character, on his morality, even the president jokes about it. Now, even you saw it a few weeks ago when Trump asked Dr. Carson to lead the cabinet into prayer. Right. That was unusual. Yes, that's, that's impact. Maybe subtle, but it's important to have that kind of, a good man, a moral man, because listen, the president is not going to change Dr. Carson, but Dr. Carson can certainly impact the president. Well, so. well let's talk about the president, because Jeannie and I have a couple of questions we, we, we want to ask you about this, because you, you raised a couple of issues earlier, Charlottesville. When, when Trump made some derogatory comments about some foreign countries. At the same time, the president said, look, African-Americans are much better off under me. Uh, unemployment hit, hit its lowest rate. What It seems like a complicated relationship, Armstrong. How do you best describe Trump's relationship with the African-American community? You know, it's not even really about his relationship with the African-American community. And it's not even complicated. It's very simple. Trump is an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> he does not discriminate. It doesn't matter. I mean, for people to try to call Trump a racist or a bigot, it's ridiculous. I mean, it doesn't matter. He offended 17 candidates, including Dr. Carson. I mean, look at what he turned his book and his mother and the hammer into. Are you kidding me? This is who he is. He can't help himself. And that's what you have to accept. But Dr. Carson, you know, forgave him put that aside because he felt the country was first because Dr. Carson's not petty. Dr. Carson's not like many of these cabinet secretaries or other people working for President Trump trying to establish a legacy. Um, Dr. Carson is an icon. He's an iconic figure and is with his pediatric neurosurgery where he had performed over 18,000 surgeries in his entire surgical career, only lost about 18 lives, and I don't think he lost any in the last seven years of surgery. I mean, he's the first to separate conjoining twins. That is something that the president respects. I think the president lacks compassion for the poor. I think the president has an issue with the weak. I think when the president perceives you as weak, um, he pounces. I mean, it's the most amazing thing that you think of. I mean, even with the African countries, and he was not talking about African countries. Some people may have said he talked about El Salvador. He talked about Haiti. Um, 
It's just people that are perceived as weak. And the countries are in dire straits. They are in dire straits. And I think what he was saying, why bring those poor people here? We've got problems of our own. Let them stay there and let the country take care of them. We can send them money, but don't bring them here. But sometimes it's how you say it. It's the optics. But, you know, that's why people like him. Because most people would say that among their friends. The president is just so transparent. He's so authentic. He's so real. Until while he gets him in trouble with the media elite and the establishment, they find him embarrassing. They, they, you know, they're haughty in their ways, and they just cannot believe that this guy can get away with this. Why? Because the American people get up in the morning and can't wait to see the president take them on, put them in their place. It's just another form of entertainment, and he does it so well. Right. He definitely cuts through the noise. Um, yes. Now, shifting gears a bit, you've written about the NFL. And after a tumultuous and very politicized season, do you think the NFL can bounce back? And if so, how? <laughs> Uh, they need to make the president one of their number one fans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, need to, they need to work on him. And I don't think it's difficult. I think it doesn't take much to run when the president's trust to get into respect. Trump pouncing on the NFL and the kneeling has had a traumatizing impact on the league. I know people, because um, I was at the Super Bowl, and many people, even in, in the playoffs, did not watch because they said, you know what? I just could not just get the, past the disrespect of the flag. These people kneeling, we paid them all this money. The president resonated. I think over the summer, while the NFL works on rebranding, one of the things they need to do, no matter, and see another thing too, you know, when these players, it's, they're going to win the NBA championship, they're going to win the Super Bowl, and immediately um, their media representative starts tweeting out, well, I'm not going to go to the White House if Trump is in the White House. That does not help. You know, you should always respect the office of the president. And if you don't want to go to the White House, keep it to yourself and just don't show up. There are just as much to blame as the president is. They're arrogant. They're disrespectful. And there's been a lot of disrespect of this president. I've never in the history of reading and living has ever seen a president treated with such utter disrespect and such dismissiveness. They can say anything about this president. And these athletes should show more respect to the president instead of because the, the bottom line, their opinion is they should have no opinion. Is my attitude. Yes, they should meet the president halfway. And by the time the NFL um, season starts, in August during preseason, in September after Labor Day when the new season starts, I think they could be off to a fast track start and they can restore the credibility that NFL has lost. Armstrong, thanks so much for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you.